Welcome to the first show of choices in your healthcare. In this show, we will be interviewing various healthcare professionals from around southern Vancouver Island and discussing with them the choices they offer for us in our healthcare. Uh, today, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lisa Polensky, a naturopathic physician and co owner of Sage Clinic here in Victoria. Welcome, Dr. Polensky, and thank you for joining us on the show. Great, thank you. Thanks for having me. Maybe we can start off by you explaining what you would find are the common causes, or you have found in your practice, the common reasons why people seek out naturopathic medicine. Sure. Um, they do fall into a number of different categories that are very common. Probably the first one is anything to do with digestive issues. So we might see young children, babies with colic, for example, all the way up to seniors who perhaps have um, irritable bowel syndrome, digestive uh, constipation, things like that. So digestive is usually number one. Okay. The second typically is anything to do with allergies, um, food allergies, hay fever, um, anything along the sort of inflammatory spectrum. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. that can be also asthma, hay fever, those kinds of things. Sure. Um, very common and un unfortunately rising in incidence, but that's typical. Um, probably the third one would be anything to do with hormonal issues. So. Typically, a naturopathic patient is usually a female, by and large, um, in the 30 to 50 age category. And so right. a lot of times, hormonal issues are significant. They might be premenstrual syndrome or um, postpartum depression, menopausal issues, those kinds of things. So hormone balancing is probably the third. Okay. The fourth is insomnia, which apparently affects 40% of the population. Of I wouldn't have guessed it was that high. It's huge. It's very significant. Okay. And, uh, and medications usually are not the solution for a lot of people, so right. that would be the fourth, fourth category. And the fifth typically is uh, anything to do with mood. So uh, depression, anxiety, um, combinations of, of those types of concerns. Even uh, just people being low motivation, lack of energy, melancholy, that kind of thing. So definitely those those five. Well, you've certainly touched on some of the major issues that yes. healthcare is, is struggling with right now. Yeah. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your training. What entails what is entailed in becoming a, a naturopathic physician? Yeah. Um, so it it basically is similar to a medical doctor in the sense that there is an undergraduate degree and then a doctoral degree. Um, the difference primarily is in how we treat. And so what we learn through the school and the education is um, like botanical uh, treatment, homeopathic treatment, uh, nutritional treatment. So we have eight years of training. Um, and then usually there, I did an extra year as a residency. So I had a, a, con a continued year. Okay. And uh, we also work in clinic as we're going through school. So it's sure. pretty exhaustive. There's uh, four schools in, in the States and two in Canada. Okay. Yeah. Now you mentioned a moment ago botanicals. What do you mean by that? So yeah, botanicals is actually a herbal medicine or herbal, it depends on how you pronounce it. Sure. Um, using plants as the form of medicine. And so they'll be in concentrates or capsules or small tinctures, extracts, those kinds of things. And they'll be used for all manner of conditions from okay. supporting heart, hypertension, th right through to digestive issues. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then why would somebody seek out your services as opposed to going to their, their medical doctor? Well, um, yeah, oftentimes people will come partly because they, they want to pursue a more natural approach. They might be a bit concerned about, um, say, pursuing a pharmaceutical approach to a condition, or perhaps in the past they've tried that and it just hasn't worked for them. Right. Um, okay. A lot of times people will come in with sort of a concept of lifestyle. They may do yoga, they may exercise, are conscious of their foods, and they want a medicine that's, that's sort of in sync or in line with uh, their approach. Okay. So that's often it. And sometimes we'll get people where they just haven't seen any success with any other type of medicine. Mm -hmm. So there'll be people who maybe have never heard of us before, but they just heard their friend give a recommendation and they say, okay, I don't know what you guys do, but I just need help. Yeah. So yeah. it will kind of come from that angle as well. Excellent. Yeah. Good. yeah. You mentioned earlier as well hormones. Um, I know there's a lot of controversy around hormone replacement therapy. Yes. I understand yeah. that the naturopathic community has something different. Yes. Well, there's, I sort of think of it as a spectrum. Um, hormone replacement therapy is, is the more pharmaceutical and it's definitely on the end of the spectrum. But if you start sort of on the other side, there's oftentimes a lot of nutritional things that you can do that will change hormonal expression in the body. Okay. Then there's botanical or herbal. Um, then there's sort of more, a little bit more um, 
almost like a natural hormonal approach that's plant-based, I would say sort of in the middle there. And then there's bioidentical, which is more like what's in the body, and, okay. and yet it is a little bit more of an external sort of hormonal focus. So there's a whole range. Whole range. And women really respond well, depending on the person, to sort of one of any of those. Okay. Yeah, And I can prescribe actually um, medications, but I typically don't because I'll usually find other solutions. Other so solutions. those will be sort of the last resort. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Before the show, you and I have been speaking about the term green medicine, and I was quite intrigued by that. Can you elaborate a bit for us yes. on what that is? Yeah, yeah. Green medicine, it, it's actually something, I mean, I've practiced for now 14 years, and I've I've often thought about the environmental impact of um, our food and our nutrition, but also the medicine. And, and what really came to me about green medicine is the idea of how a medicine is created and how it impacts the environment is, is one part of it. And so herbal medicine and homeopathic remedies are usually very tiny portions of a plant. So a lot of times the plant is, remains intact while the remedy is created. But the other part of it is if a person consumes a pharmaceutical, for example, um, when they excrete in the urine or in the stool, they, the pharmaceutical actually does not biodegrade and it is not altered. So it ends up, which is an unfortunate um, concern, but it ends up in the waterways, it ends up in the ocean, it ends up in the soil. Um, there's one, for example, one class of medicine uh, called SSRIs, which are um, support for depression and mood, and they're actually being detected in um, shellfish and in the ocean. So the concept of green medicine to me is if someone has an option, which we all do, for how we're going to treat our bodies, if you chose an herbal or a botanical option or a homeopathic, you're not going to negatively impact the environment just by mm. virtue of yeah. utilizing that medicine. And unfortunately, the pharmaceuticals um, is more along that path. Don't break down. Yeah, and certainly, I, I completely agree, some of them are absolutely necessary, but given a lot of situations, the natural remedy is effective, it's very safe, and then now if we think of the environment, it will not negatively impact sure. the environment. Yeah. Well, if everybody was using the green medicine, we wouldn't have to have a sewer treatment plant, supposedly. Yes, right. Maybe. Yes, well. We'll get for another day. And, and <laughs> apparently, they're not altered in the sewage treatment either. So that even wouldn't affect it. it it's right beyond through. that. Yeah. 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 yeah, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Maybe you can tell us a little bit of what you personally bring into your practice. What does, yeah. what does Lisa, Dr. Polinsky, bring into her practice? Well, I was thinking sort of how, yeah, how am I distinct? And I, I think one thing, um, my undergrad degree was in psychology. I went to UVic and mm -hmm. I pursued psychology. I was always interested in human behavior and, and um, people's um, sort of drive and what made them tick. And I brought that into the, the medicine in terms of I'm often thinking about what's important for that person, uh, what are the stressors with this person. So I sort of think of it as like the psychology of, of okay. healing and health and people taking steps towards that. So. I think that is, is one aspect and, um, and I also, being a mother of young children and kind of going through different hormonal changes myself, I think having the experience and then being able to be real with people, you know, if I'm giving them a treatment plan, I'm yeah. often thinking, well, would I be able to do that? That's very important. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. is. And yeah. I didn't used to be that way, but, you know, going through it with children, it, it kind of changes things. So Having children does change your yeah. uh, perspective <laughs> on a few things, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, it definitely Sleep. does. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. Um, Maybe you could elaborate a little bit more. You were talking about the digestive mm -hmm. uh, issues. How would you treat, say, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, or, right. or how would you approach that if somebody came in and said, I, I have Crohn's, I have colitis, right. and I've kind of lost any further um, ability to treat allopathically? Well, and that, that's a great example. Um, I mean, I'll start with irritable bowel because that tends to be the, the bigger category, but mm -hmm. usually what happens in that situation is a person has a couple difficulties. One is they don't know what to eat. They feel oftentimes they're better if they just don't eat. Right. So part of what we do is figure out what are the foods that they're sensitive to, and there's a couple different ways we can go. Can you elaborate on that a bit for it, us? Because yeah. I know there's a lot of confusion about how to get tested for food allergies. Right. Um, well, there's food allergies, which are more the immune response, right. and that's that's through a blood test, mm -hmm. so that we can do. That uh, there's labs in the states that we send the blood to, okay. so that is one option. I tend to do one in office that I've learned. That's a little unique. It's food sensitivity testing, okay. and that's through an acupuncture point and testing resistance. Okay. So right in the office, people will leave with a list of these are the foods that you likely are sensitive to, mm -hmm. and then um, and then that's kind of close to a, like a, if they do um, introduction, elimination, reintroduction sort of process. But this is a little more exact. Okay. Um, 
And so they'll leave with a list of what foods may be the best choices for them to avoid for a month. Sure. So it's usually a, a diet issue, what foods. And then the second part is what is happening with the bacterial balance in their digestive system. Mm -hmm. And usually we see with irritable bowel system or irritable bowel disease, excuse me, um, or irritable bowel syndrome that they've lost the balance of digestive function. So right. they might have a history of numerous antibiotics, which will change the bacterial balance. Right possibly stress or some kind of combination. And so they'll have bloating, they'll have gas, they'll have difficulty, they'll have urgency, all those kinds of things that mm -hmm. when they get the right bacteria or probiotics, which um, are supportive for bacterial growth, right. acidophilus is a, is a very common one. Right. When they get the right dose and the right potency, and that's very important, um, plus the good sort of appropriate diet for them, that can make all the difference. Okay. So those okay. are really the two steps. Two yeah. Yeah. Just to put it in perspective for the viewers, um, I was reading a couple of weeks ago that we have around one trillion cells in our body yeah. and we have 100 trillion bacteria in our body. Right. So we're basically are walking bacteria and when that balance gets out of, yeah. out, of, uh, out of balance, then we're in trouble. Exactly. And I, I learned recently as well, about two pounds of our body weight is bacteria. So is that right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So then when you <laughs> mentioned probiotics, what, would, what do you mean by probiotics? Where would somebody get probiotics or what are common sources? Yeah, so probiotics just means sort of pro-life and, um, and that's the bacteria that support life and there's, there's around 400 or so different strains of bacteria in our digestive system. Okay. Some of them are supportive and some of them aren't. So the probiotics are the, the strains that are very helpful and beneficial. Mm. Um, again, acidophilus is one common one that people know. And, and they can get them through diet, although a lot of people are dairy sensitive and sometimes yogurt is the source of that. But if a person is sensitive to dairy, then they can actually just get it through a powder or a capsule of the bacteria. Okay. So it that way. yeah, it can make a huge difference. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes people will come in thinking I'll eat a lot of yogurt, but then it actually makes their system worse. And yes. yeah, not, not always the solution. Okay. And, and another source too is uh, fermented foods such as sauerkraut or kimchi. Um, mm -hmm. That can be a source of support for bacterial balance as well. The nice thing about those two is that they're fairly easy to make at home. Right. I make yes. my own sauerkraut and I make enough for the whole winter and it costs me probably $10. Right. Beautiful. And I have fun yeah. making it. <laughs> I get out in the farmer's <laughs> fields and pick my cabbage. and Yeah. So it's a very, um, very approachable way of helping your health. Right. And, and what I understand is a lot of traditional cultures would usually have a form of um, a bacterial support like that. Some kind of food that was fermented that was right. just a traditional food. Right. And we sort now of Now what about that. miso? Miso, yes, that exactly. Another one that that's, that's another one. That's yeah. another one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. In your opinion, would it be uh, important to be getting organic miso? Yes, absolutely. Why is that? Um, well, that does sort of nod a little bit to the concern around genetic modification. So if somebody, so an organic source, Canadian, local, brilliant, that would be okay. great. But okay. anything other than that, from a soy form, you're potentially getting into a genetic modification. Um, and apparently 80% of all the soy crops are already genetically modified in the States and in other locations. So if you had somebody come into your office with digestive concerns and their diet was in fact including a fair amount of GMO, would that be an issue for you? Would you? Yes, absolutely. Would and, and that's a very good point. Uh, one of the issues there is that the protein is altered in a genetically modified food. And proteins are what people tend to react to okay. with more of an allergenic situation or digestive problems. So absolutely GMOs, in my opinion, are a concern okay. and something you definitely want to avoid. Okay. Yeah. 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 Something to remember yes. when we're shopping next time. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah read the labels. Yeah. You do much work with infants. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What, is, what is your passion of, with infants? Um, I love working with the children because to me that's true prevention. If you can help a little child, for example, with colic, I love the infants where they come in and, and they might have some digestive issues. There's infant probiotics that we can give and there's medicine for babies and helping the nursing mother as well okay. can be helpful. But the way I think you know, prevention in medicine I, really starts at that age. Um, because if you can help their system in those early years, you've helped their immune system for the whole, your, their whole life. Sure. So sure. to me, that's really very exciting. What I understand about the bacteria in the, in the immune system is that in the first few years, that's when it's established. Yes, absolutely. And if you can keep that established, you have a child with health thereafter. Right, absolutely. This, I very much agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. And how long have you been in practice now? Uh, be, I've been in practice 14 years. 14 so, years? So, yeah. And your clinic is located here in Victoria? In Victoria, yep, down on Fort Street, Fort and Quadra. And I understand you're a third generation Victorian. Yes, yeah, uh, my grandmother, um, my parents, myself, so yes. And I think actually her mother as well uh, 
wasn't born here, but she was born up in, in BC. So fourth generation BC, third generation Victorian. Good. And where's your lo uh, practice located? It's um, Suite uh, 304, 852 Fort Street. In Fort Street. So Fort and Quadra right downtown, the Sage Clinic. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So, Dr. Polinski, thank you very much for coming on to the show. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your knowledge with us and the viewers. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it for today, folks. Uh, I'd like to thank you for watching. Uh, my name is Cameron Moffat, and I'm an osteopathic practitioner here in Victoria. And on behalf of myself and the crew at Cable 4, I'd like to thank you for watching your choices in healthcare. And until the next episode, thank you and have a good day. Mm -hmm.